Hey guys, it's Jan for Chess24. In this video, we're gonna cover the game Vichy Anand against Levan Aronian, played in the Candidates Tournament. Round 9, both players in the leading group, Levan Aronian, one of the co-leaders on plus two, two wins, no losses, by, while Vichy has won two games and lost one game. This game, Anand with the white pieces, goes for the move 1e4, which he stuck to throughout the tournament. And everybody who's faced e4 so far in this Canadian tournament has answered it with the move e5. No one dares to play Sicilian. But Levon, of course, tends to play e5 pretty exclusively, so no surprises here. No surprise on the third move either, because bishop c4, as Anand plays in this game, has become a serious alternative to bishop b5 at the highest level, mainly due to Berlin fatigue, if you want my opinion. Bishop c4, bishop to c5, short castles. We've seen all this in many recent games, so I'm gonna sort of run through the opening moves here. d6, not the most common. Knight f6 is more common, but it tends to lead to the same position. After knight f6, black has to reckon with the sharp gambit d4, which some players like to avoid. Therefore d6 is played, and Arnold shows he has no intention to challenge the center immediately, which you could argue is a drawback of d6. Because c3, d4, black just goes bishop b6, and these pawns are sort of high maintenance, so you don't want to do this too early with white. Anand set plays the common setup d3, knight f6, c3. Black plays a6. I've talked about the differences between a6 and a5 in earlier videos as well. I believe this discussion will still continue if black should go a6 or a5 to create this loof for his bishop on a7. And a4, this is the move that has led to the re rejuvenation of the Duke of Piano in many a line, turning knight a3, knight c2, and from there bishop to e3. Bishop a7, standard prophylaxis, even though a lot of guys prefer to start with castles, it's not a huge difference. Bishop a7, knight to a3, knight to e7. This is where Aronian sort of goes his own way. He wants to relocate this knight to g6 as quickly as possible, because in the structure the knight on c6 is black's weakest piece dominated by the pawn on c3, therefore it's logical to bring it over here. But of course it does cost a little time in practice setups with castles, let's say knight c2, h6, intending to play bishop e6 have been more popular recently. Knight to e7, knight to c2, knight to g6. Both sides are working on their desired setup, bishop e3, this is the point of white's play, especially since this bishop lost the tempo going back to a7. White now does not mind exchanging it. Short castles, bishop takes a7 and rook takes a7. This rook, of course, not ideally placed, is gonna have to lose another move going back to a8. And that's what white is basing his hopes on for a tiny initiative. His pieces aren't really better than the black pieces, but he has a bit of a lead in development because of this rook being misplaced and He's gonna try to use that possibly to open the position in the center. First, Anna goes knight to e3, the best square for this knight. And Aronia is trying to make use of the fact that Anand has not played the move h3, which they often play earlier in the Juku Piano. He wants to exchange this knight by playing knight to g4. Perfectly reasonable move. You could make a case for keeping all pieces on the board as well, playing something like rook to a8. I don't know what white would do, maybe a5, getting some space here. And then c6. Playing a structure like that, arguably white is a tiny bit better, but it's nothing special, never is, in this opening. Instead, knight g4, quite logical, black is trying to exchange pieces, solve his problems, and Anand decides to maintain the structure, goes queen to d2, tending to recapture on e3 with the knight. There was a sharper alternative, h3, provoking knight takes e3, now playing f takes e3, tending to build up some pressure against the f7 pawn, which was interesting in my opinion. I believe that Vichy shies away from this structure because he's lost a game against Magnus Carlsen in the World Championship match in this very structure and probably he decided it's not his cup of tea. Queen d2, logical move as well. Turning after knight e3, queen e3 to hit this rook on a7 and Aronian takes an interesting decision here which positionally is sound but it feels a little slow. He goes a6, a5. Just trying to stop white from 
grabbing more space on this side of the board. But of course it does lose another move and you could argue that it made sense to play rook to a8 instead when if white plays d4 as in the game black would be doing quite all right after knight takes e3, queen takes e3 and bishop to g4 finishing his development with no problems as far as I can tell. Instead after a5 is played d4 now Aronian retreated his rook He's eliminated all sorts of getting squeezed on the queen side, but Anand uses this extra half tempo he's gained to alter the structure. He takes on e5, and here would not be a great idea for black to recapture with the pawn, because now the white initiative gets very serious attacking this pawn on f7. Therefore, the knight has to recapture. Knight takes, knight takes. de5, still not a great idea. Because after takes takes this time around white goes rook fd1 and he still has a bit of an initiative because black finds it very hard to get this bishop out on a good square. So Aronian decides to take with the knight and now white has achieved tiny little something. He does have a bit more space in the center. Still nothing special, it's a slowish position. Aronian decides to regroup his knight, goes knight to d7, bishop to c2 rook to e8, f3 and b6, trying to put this bishop here, this knight either on e6 or maybe back to f6, depending on circumstances. White is a tiny bit better, but it's very hard to create direct play. A kingside attack with f4 would always leave this pawn on e4 very vulnerable. Rook fd1, Anand doesn't hurry anything and Aronian decides to provoke the move b4 by playing knight to c5. Not forced, but also not a mistake. He wants white to commit to b4 to make white a little less flexible on the queen side. You could certainly argue for other moves here as well. Knight to f8, bishop to b7, knight to f6, h6. All playable, all a tiny bit better for white. Knight c5, b4, knight back to d7, bishop to b3. Now they can no longer hit. get hit with knight c5. It occupies its rightful diagonal again. And Aronian continues shuffling his pieces around, knight to f6. Looks like he's lost a lot of time, but <coughs> white also hasn't done all that much damage in the meantime. Therefore, the position is still quite tenable for black. Queen to d4, just grabbing some space. And here we surprisingly are at a crucial moment in the game where Aronian plays a move queen to e7, which turns out to be very, very risky and is gonna determine the play that follows. An alternative given by Anand was to just play something like bishop to d7, when if white goes knight d5, as he will in the game, knight takes, bishop takes, then black can play rook to b8, and after b takes a5, b takes a5, queen to a7, this is just for comparison's sake, black gains a lot of activity by going queen g5, intending rook to b2. So this was possible and probably stronger than the move in the game, because in the game Aronian plays queen e7, and now Anand pounces with knight to d5, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, and black faces a bit of a problem on the queen side. If he goes rook b8, then b takes a, b takes a, queen a7, or rook b1, also a good move. But this is now a different story. This rook is under attack. There's no time for going queen g5 or any aggressive moves. Therefore, black loses a pawn and doesn't get enough for it. While in the game, Aronian decided on the move rook to a7, Maintaining his queenside structure, but putting this rook out of play, it's dominated by this bishop for now. Aronia had seen, them, had seen this coming, thought it was no big deal. He could very well be right about it, but it is a little worrying to have this rook out of play, at least for now. Anna closes the queenside with b5, trying to box it out. Bishop to b7, intending to free the rook. But now I play c4, and it turns out that in order to free it, you gotta make a positional concession take on d5, allowing white c takes d5, when he can put some pressure on the c pawn. Which <clears throat> might not be the end of the world, but combined with the fact that this rook is misplaced here, this rook could beam itself to d7 or e7, black would be okay, but he's not quite in time in these lines. I believe Aronian gave some line like this, where it's gonna be very, very awkward to keep everything defended. Queen to d8, queen to c3, rook to e7, white, for example. I believe he has a little trick like this. Oh no, he doesn't, sorry, I'm <coughs> stupid. 
set of queen c3, you have to start with rook c4 to set up this trick, rook e7, queen c3. And now this is a threat, and therefore black is not in time to keep everything under control, let's say. f5, rook takes b6, c takes b, rook c8, favors white. Long line, but goes to show that the defense wasn't so easy after this bishop takes d5. There are some comparable lines in theory, which are considered to be okay for black, but there normally the rook does not end up on a7. One example, let me show you a position. This is from a game between Rugger and Rapport in the King's Indian defense, and the game ended in a draw here. The reason being that black is active enough, can get some counterplay later. His rook is not stuck on a7, therefore there was no big problem. Still, no such thing in the game, and therefore Aronian decides to go for the endgame with queen to e5, exchange queens, but it turns out this does not solve all his problems, because it's still gonna be tough to get this rook into the game without leaving long-term weaknesses. King to f8, king to f2, and later preferred f4, but I don't really see much of a difference. King e7, now f4, intending to go after the kingside pawns with rook c3, rook h3, rook g3, it's also possible in many lines to just push the pawns on the king side, grabbing some space. Well, black is still trying to sort out the situation of his rook on a7. Takes on d5, cd5 is always unpleasant. The alternative plan he would have is to prepare c6, but that also runs into trouble in many lines, weakening the b6 pawn. So for now, black has to stay passive and just wait. That's what Aronia does, goes f6, rook c3, king to d7. Rook to h3, h6, rook to g3, fishing for weaknesses. g5, for example, would leave some fresh weaknesses here and there. And that would be very, very bad news for black. After, let's say, rook h3, it's a very bad position. So black has to stay passive, go rook to e7. And Anand plays a nice prophylactic move. He plays the move rook g6, which is a logical move anyway. Activating this rook, but it's directed against the black idea of breaking free with c6 because it can now be met with takes takes and a powerful breakthrough with e5 and you figure out yourself there is no way black can avoid getting steamrolled here because this rook would do a pretty good job on the sixth rank therefore aronian finally committed he understood he can't get c6 and committed to taking on d5 c takes d5 at least this rook now can't attack the c7 pawn which is well defended for now and play this position, but here, after rook to a8, king to f3, I believe he committed a mistake. The white plan is to put the king on f5, and maybe that scared Aronian, and he tried to prevent it by going rook a to e8, but now this king finds it hard to reach the king side where he can could defend the new weakness on g7, and it seems that this was the right moment to play king to e8, not being afraid of the white plan of putting his king on f5, because in this position black goes h5, just forcing, not allowing this king to retreat. Some lines he can try rook h8, h4, rook h5 check. So white will probably have to play h4 to stop that idea. But now black just sits and waits passively and it seems like there's no way for white to improve his position. Let's say he goes here, which is the most active he can get. But black just goes rook g8, can't get into Zugzwang, you can always move this rook. And white doesn't really have any way to improve, so it seems like the black fortress was still very much holding here, in spite of our Aronian being under some pressure. But this is time travel, this is move 37, he goes rook a8, and Anand seizes the chance to play king g4 anyway, even though this pawn on e4 is hanging. He's not afraid of it, because he judges that the pawn on g7 is more important. Rook takes e4, rook g7, king to c8, still time travel, an innocent, innocent enough looking move, but a mistake, he had to play king to d8, keeping an eye on the e7 square. The difference is, if white plays rook to d2, as in the game, then black can quite comfortably defend with rook to e7, rook takes, king takes, this king helps defending the king side, and black is not worse with the attack. Now I'm not sure if that's true actually. Black is not worse, but it was certainly a worthy resource because the attack on a4 does give counterplay. 
In general, you're gonna see a lot of probably untrue statements of mine about rook endings in the play that is to come. Because yeah, me giving advice on rook endings is about as useful as me giving advice on, I don't know, art history or something. It's not a topic I understand particularly well, but I am reasonably sure that king c8 was worse than king d8, because king d8 is more flexible, keeping an eye on this square. So king c8, Alan goes rook d2, his point is now rook takes a4, runs into rook c2, winning. Therefore, Aronian decided to play king b8, another time travel mistake, it was much better to play king b7, because in the lines that are to follow, the king would be more active on b7 should the queen side ever open up than it is on b8, and that's the tempo he might miss later. King b8, now he has made the time control, rook c2. Here he has to go passive with rook c8, rook to a2, just keeping the pawn now that the rook has gone passive, intending to go king f5, cashing in on the king side. Now black's position is pretty bad. Aronian decides to go after the d5 pawn. Anand does mind, goes king f5, rook d5, king f6. And we see that the difference in king activity, but also the difference in pawn strength, white can easily push his pawns up the board, while for black it's very hard to mobilize these passive guys, do make a huge factor, and therefore black is in serious trouble here. Aronian decides on rook f8, Anand, very clear cut, plays a move, rook f7 has judged that the single rook endgame is very good for him, king e6 was also possible. A rook f7 is a good move, he's giving up the f4 pawn after rook f5 check, but he's gonna get the h6 pawn and that's more important. King g6, rook takes f4, one more subtlety, g3, important Swiss and Zug, because if you take black goes rook h4, takes here, black is fine. We have to g3, white's gonna keep both his pawns and black is gonna lose the h6 pawn, and that should have been the end of the game, but it wasn't. Spoiler alert, rook to c4, king takes h6, d5. Here Anand commits a very strange mistake for Anand standards. He plays a move king to h5. Trying to support his g-pawn advancing, but it was way more natural and way stronger to play king to g5. The point is king g5 clears away for the h-pawn. This h-pawn is further away from the black king, so the black king has a much harder time getting to it. And also the king on g5 might turn out to be useful in some lines just to stop the black d-pawn. So after king g5 the game would be over very quickly. If black goes d4 as he will in the game h4 d3 then many many ways lead to Rome. The simplest probably just rook to d2. <clears throat> Let's say rook d4 h5 and there is absolutely nothing that black can do. In the game king h5 was played and now the struggle resumes because here after d4, <coughs> sorry, g4, d3, h4, g5, rook d4 is a similar story. h4, rook d4, white has to go rook d2 to stop the pawn. King to c8, now the black king is in time to fight against the g pawn, which it wouldn't have been against the h pawn. g5, king d7, king g6, white is still better, black only has one trump, while the white trump can be supported by his king and these pawns find it very hard to mobilize, but this is much harder to win. Aronian plays a natural move here, rook takes h4, but it could very well be that ignoring this pawn, as crazy it may look, was a tougher defense. To play king e7, h5, king to f8, this king now fights against both the passed pawns, and as mentioned, I lack expertise to judge if this is winning for white or not. My best guess is it is winning for white, but I honestly don't know, this is still a very tricky situation to convert. Instead, Aronian plays the most natural move. Rook takes h4, rook takes d3 check, king to e8, trying to stay close to this pawn. Rook to a3, Anand once again has to spend one tempo for defending his a pawn. And now rook to c4, which I believe to be another mistake, rook c4. It's logical, he wants to cover a c pawn, maybe prepare c6, but he allows the white king to take a very deep position in the low post on g7, sealing the black king and preparing the advance of the pawn, and I don't think there's any coming back from it. We see the engine bar, now after some thought, jumping. Instead, once again, more resilient was the move king to f8, which was probably losing as well, stopping king g7, but it would have made white 
work much harder. Seems that white is winning after rook to c3. Rook takes a4, rook takes c7. One key tactic is rook b4 is met with rook b7. And now even though black is a pawn up all of a sudden, king f6 and the mating threats combined with the g-pawn will win the day for white. So it seems like white was still winning here, even though don't quiz me on the position after, let's say, rook a1, how white wins, because I would not pass that test. So after rook c4, king g7, I am fairly positive this is now totally winning again. And in the game, no big surprises happened. King d7, g6, c6, Aronia is trying to create counterplay on the queen side. In some lines, you could dream of giving your pawn, rook for the g-pawn and then drawing with, let's say, an a-pawn against a white rook. But this is not going to happen. Anand goes king f6, clearing the way. And there is just no defense. If rook f4 check, for example, king g5 wins on the spot, planning g7. So instead, c takes b5 was played, g7, threatening g8 queen, rook to g4, and just a takes b5. And this pawn will cost the rook. We're going to see how in a minute black is not going to be in time to create enough counterplay on the queen side. If king d6, for example, white can just go rook c3, stopping king c5, and then support his pawn or pick up the black pawn. Said rook g1 was played, rook to d3 check, forcing the king to a worse location. King e8, rook e3 check, king d7, and the very instructive bridge building technique by Vishiana, rook e5, intending to go rook to g5, supporting this pawn. Ends the game, rook g5 is a massive threat, therefore black had to play rook takes g7. And king takes g7 was a pretty good move here, which I probably would have played, but Anand, trying to be even more precise, or maybe to rub it in a little, gave the check, rook d5 check first, forcing the black king to an even worse location. And the races that are about to follow are not very close, something like. I don't know, I'll probably find a way to mess this up, but it is very hard. Because this pawn, without the support of his king, which is cut off along the fifth rank, really doesn't go very far. White can even go king e4, a2, rook d5, king anywhere, rook d1. Then pick up this pawn. Therefore, Levon Aronian resigns. So yeah, strange game. Not that many spectacular moments, but just steady play by Vishiana, building a small initiative and growing it after queen to e7. Aronian still had drawing chances later in the game, but he was under pressure throughout and it's very hard to hold such situations against Vichy. was always comfortable. Yeah, when he's not running risks, he can squeeze, he uses great understanding, great technique. He scores his third win with the white pieces, one e4, dangerous weapon in the hands of Vichy Anand. And he clearly was happy after the game. Here we see, I don't think that's an actual photo, but a big smile on Vichy's face, surprised Levon Aronian, who drops back to plus one, is overtaken, leapfrogged, I believe is the term, in the standings by Vichy Anand. Let's look at those standings. Okay, I'll even cover myself up behind them. Sage Kayakin and Vichy Anand, the Winner and runner-up of the last candidates tournament in the lead with five and a half out of nine. Pursued by Fabiano Carana and Levon Aronian on plus one. Anish Giri drew all his games so far. Our friend Peter Svidler, one loss, eight draws. And Nakamura Topalov won't be happy about their tournament. That's the <clears throat> round nine report from the candidates. Thank you guys for watching. There's still, I can't count. Five games to go, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Still some chess to come in the candidates. The next challenger for Magnus Carlsen is still very, very unknown. Thanks for watching, see you soon, bye bye.